Okay, guys, we're going to be in for a treat today because uh, we're going to see some real live stuff. <laughs> I'll leave it up to you to tell them what it's all about. All right. But again, my name is Dr. Dave Harper, and it's, very, it's a large pleasure for me to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Douglas Stoddard. He's a sports medicine physician, is the medical director of the Sports and Exercise Medicine Institute. After receiving his medical degree from the University of Toronto, he trained in Australia at the Australian Institute of Sport in Canberra, obtaining his master's degree in sports medicine. He is also a diplomat of the Canadian Academy of Sports and Exercise Medicine and has his focused practice designation of sports medicine from the Ontario Medical Association. Dr. Stoddard is a consultant to the Canadian military and has consulted with well over 30,000 unique patients in his career. Let's hear it for Dr. Stoddard. Thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate that. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this talk. Uh, this is a talk that will um, focus on a particular type of injection therapy that is now an option for injuries and really all injuries all over the body. We're, of course, focusing on the shoulder this weekend. But these injections are, uh, can be used really anywhere that there's a chronic injury that's not responding to what I would consider first steps, which include therapy, activity modification, relative rest, and a gradual ramp up back into full activities. Sometimes tissue is damaged, and it's damaged to the point where it's not healing on its own. We've all seen it. Uh, many of us have probably had our own injuries where that has been the case. And that's when we have to intervene, actually go into the tissue and, and stimulate it in different ways. And this is certainly one way that we can do that. So we're talking today about um, PRP, which stands for platelet-rich plasma, and stem cell transplantation. We're going to do a live injection after the talk on uh, uh, Richard Singh, who we've been treating for an injury that we'll discuss uh, a little later in the talk. So uh, the rotator cuff uh, muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis. We're talking also about the pectoralis major, which is the tendon and, or muscle and tendon that we're dealing with with Richard a little later. And then the biceps tendon. These are the bulk of the tendons and muscles we treat around the shoulder with injection therapy. So here's a pictorial rotator cuff muscles. We got the anterior view here, subscapularis, <coughs> supraspinatus. And then the posterior view, we see again supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. And as most of you know, these are the four muscles of the rotator cuff. Then we have the pec, <coughs> and uh, we've got the sternal head, clavicular heads. You might notice an extra bit of red there. This is to indicate a pec strain. This is actually the area where Richard has, uh, in the past, tore his pec. And um, so in him, this is the area where we have been treating, only on the left side. This is a picture of the right side. And these are the biceps long and short heads with their respective tendons, short head onto the coracoid process, long head all the way up into the labrum in the glenohumeral joint. So those are the targets that we would select in terms of trying to help people with uh, chronic tears in these structures that aren't settling down with conservative measures. So as I said, the first line is always activity modification, some therapy and graduated return to the activity. But uh, for unresponsive tendinopathies, tendon tears, muscle tears, Injection therapy is the next step. It bridges the more conservative therapy to the most aggressive surgery. So this is a nice middle step. This step works well for a lot of people, and we actually have been able to uh, slow down people's needs to actually go see a surgeon with this kind of injection therapy. So where did it all start? It all started with something called prolotherapy back in the 1930s. It turns out it was a surgeon who had injured uh, the ulnar collateral ligament of his thumb, and it produced some chronic laxity in the thumb, and as a surgeon, he found that difficult to operate, etc. So um, at that time, hernia specialists had begun to inject hernias with high concentration dextrose solutions, trying to stimulate an inflammatory reaction in scar tissue, and there was some success being reported, so this surgeon thought, why not? and he injected himself with a high concentrated dextro solution. And the story goes that his thumb, thank you, that his thumb did improve. 
and uh, so began prolotherapy, which stands for proliferant, being injected to stimulate soft tissue repair. The normal con uh, components of a prolotherapy solution are dextrose, which is simply blood sugar, otherwise called glucose, sodium moroate, which is a derivative of cod liver oil, and then we have saline or salt water. So these things are often mixed together to get a solution that will stimulate an inflammatory reaction when we actually inject it into our target. So why do we do this? Well, back to the surgeon in the 30s, we've got some looseness in a ligament or some connective tissue. And what we want to do is stimulate some tightening in this tissue. Why? Because when tissues are loose, like ligaments that support joints, there's extra pain due to stimulation of mechano, sorry guys, stimulation of mechanoreceptors. So if we can tighten up that tissue, especially around a joint that's painful, then we can often relieve the person's pain. So this is prolotherapy, and this is where injection therapy began. And again, this is our usual mix. We have dextrose, we have uh, saline or sodium chloride, and we often put a little bit of freezing in there as well. And so this is a standard mix. And then we add other substances, such as the sodium moral weight we talked about earlier, which is, again, extract of cod liver oil. Why? Because it's really irritating. And that's what we want to do when we, when we inject these individuals. This is an example of a map that we may put on someone's neck if we're doing a prolotherapy round of injections. So you can imagine that every one of those points gets a needle. And so it's quite extensive. Why do we pick these points in the neck? Because every one of them corresponds to some ligament, some supportive structure that we inject. So somebody with chronic neck pain, for instance, we'd actually take this mix and every single one of these points, quite deep some of them, we inject. I can see some grimacing um, in terms of, wow, do you really do that? Yeah, and patients do put up with it. Oftentimes they're kind of at their last resort and they're willing to try anything. This stuff actually really works when there's a ligamentous problem that is involving laxity and we're trying to tighten up those ligaments. That's what this stuff does. Multiple studies have confirmed successes using prolotherapy in low back pain, neck pain, plantar fascia issues, arthritis in joints, and various tendinopathies all over the body. So this stuff does work. It's been around for a long time. It's really not debated anymore whether this actually works. If you have someone who you know who's chronically irritated in some part of their body, they could be a candidate for this if they've run out of other options. So having said that, personally I don't use prolotherapy much anymore, at least not with those traditional solutions. PRP came on the scene about, oh, about 10 to 20 years ago. But in a big way, at least in Canada, it's been around for about five years. So in my practice, at least, uh, those dextro solutions have been replaced by platelet-rich plasma. How many have heard of platelet-rich plasma? Okay, so this is not a new concept. What is it? Well, it's the same principles as prolotherapy. We're still trying to do something directly to the tissue. Prolotherapy solutions are meant to irritate the tissue. PRP solutions do irritate. But basically what they're trying to do is stimulate a repair in the tissue through a variety of different mechanisms. How do they do that? They do stimulate some inflammation, but PRP contains multiple growth factors, proteins, cytokines, chemokines. These are all uh, compounds that cells make in our body that have a role in healing. Importantly too, they stimulate stem cells. And as we probably all know, stem cells are cells that make new tissue. We're going to talk a bit more about stem cell transplants a little later in this talk. So PRP has a stimulating effect on stem cells. And in the end, if anything's going to heal in our bodies, it usually will involve stem cells repairing things. So three blood cells sitting here. How many people think this one is the platelet? Hands up. How many people think that one is the platelet? And how many think that one's the platelet? That is the platelet right there. So that's the target cell. This is a red blood cell. This is a white blood cell. And that's our platelet. This is a scanning electron micrograph. So that's the cell we're interested in when we're talking about PRP and platelet-rich plasma. 
Does it work? Yes. 50% of studies show that this stuff works. So here's a list of some references, and there's many more. 50%. Does it work? No. 50%. 50% of studies say that PRP does not work. So why am I up here talking about something that works only 50% of the time? Well, here's the challenge. Research to date with PRP has included many, many different cocktails of PRP. There's different manufacturers, there's different methods of making PRP. And so unfortunately we have very little consistency in the literature comparing to the same protocols, the same uh, mixtures of PRP, and therefore it's been very, very difficult to interpret. But that is what the science says as of now. We make PRP, this is an example, this is a, a tube that we place blood in and we're actually making some PRP as we speak uh, from Richard Singh's blood. And what we do is we draw out some blood, we put it in a container, and then we spin it in a centrifuge. And based on the specific gravity of different components of the blood, we see different layers start to form in the tube. So this top layer is the least dense layer, and it's called platelet-poor plasma. Believe it or not, some people are actually trying to do things with platelet-poor plasma. I don't know why, but they are. But at the end of the day, I'm not too interested in that, and most people aren't who do injections. Then we have this middle layer called the Buffy coat. This is a white layer where uh, many of the cells tend to um, gather, and especially the platelets, because those are the cells we're most interested in. So this is the area that we're interested in as far as this tube of blood. And the bottom layer is the most dense, that's the red blood cells. So we can separate blood in a centrifuge, and this is the layer that we're interested in, the Buffy coat. Here's how we make it. We take some uh, blood out of the person's arm, we put it in the tube, we spin it in the centrifuge, get it all separated, take out the platelet-rich part, which is right here in the middle, that's the stuff we're really interested in, and then we uh, inject it into the patient. And uh, we have the option of using ultrasound guidance when we inject. Uh, it's an important part of the injections because it helps us know exactly where our target is and what we're looking for in terms of the injection. Some tears, for instance, are pretty small. You can't see them, uh, you know, obviously with skin in the way and you can't feel them. Uh, we use the ultrasound to find the tears and then guide our needle directly into the tear. So it's a very precise, very exact way to target the injury. So PRP contains platelets, white blood cells, whole whack of growth factors, and red blood cells. And that's it in a nutshell. This is an, a, a picture of a harvest centrifuge. Harvest is a company that makes PRP equipment. And uh, this is a centrifuge that we use in our clinic. And we put the <clears throat> blood into one side of the centrifuge. That's a counterweight there. Close the lid, turn it on, and it spins, and um, it separates the blood. So growth factors are what we're after in PRP. And you know, for years, we've all been trying to find uh, things that help us heal, things that help us grow. And so this cocktail is among the most powerful cocktails that we've discovered in terms of what helps tissue. So we've got a whole whack of these growth factors, platelet-derived growth factor, transforming growth factor, beta, and so on and so on and so on. And there's many more. You'll notice this one down here, inter or insulin like growth factor. That's the, the, the um, protein that human growth hormone affects, and most effects of growth hormone are exerted through IGF. I get the question a lot, what if we added a little bit of growth hormone to PRP? Wouldn't it work better? In my opinion, no, it wouldn't work better because this cocktail here is much more potent anyway, and I don't believe adding some growth hormone would actually change that because this is a very powerful cocktail of growth factors. White blood cells, as we talked about a little earlier, are also a component of blood. And this is where PRP research is evolving. Do we want white blood cells in this concoction? Why wouldn't we want them? Because it looks like they might actually cause more inflammation than what we want. It increases pain when you inflame people too much. Uh, neutrophils or white blood cells contain secretory granules some inflammatory proteins. They're all pro-inflammatory. Does this affect the outcome? We're trying to figure that out. So different PRP systems will isolate uh, different aspects of the blood. Some will take out more white blood cells than others. 
This is again why the literature is so confused right now in terms of does this stuff work. So there are different cytokines in this uh, concoction and um, some uh, will be helpful for what we're trying to do and some apparently seem to hinder it. So here's a, a slide. Um, this is platelet poor plasma. This is leukocyte poor PRP. So we've taken out the blood cells, or sorry, the white blood cells. This is leukocyte rich PRP. So we've kept the white blood cells in. And this is red blood cells. Platelet poor plasma doesn't contain much. Leukocyte poor PRP contains some important anti inflammatory cytokines. That's great. Contains very few damaging cytokines. This is the damaging part. Leukocyte rich PRP seems to contain more of these damaging cytokines. And that could be important as we get better at making PRP. So the bottom line here is that the whole field is evolving very rapidly. The mix is changing. Different techniques are being used to change the mix till we stumble on that magic formula. So here's a bunch of uh, cytokines. Some are good, some are bad for cartilage. So this is chondrogenic, helping cartilage heal. And we use Lots of PRP and in cartilage injuries. Cartilage tears in the knee, meniscal tears. We're now using this injection therapy to try and stimulate repair in these tears before sending them off to surgeons. So we can see here that some of these are antichondrogenic. They'll inhibit the growth of cartilage. Some of these are prochondrogenic. They'll stimulate the growth of cartilage. So once again, it's still very early in our understanding of all of this, but this is where the field's going to go. We're going to get more selective with being able to stimulate repair. And some tissues may need different mixes than other tissues. And we're really very far away from understanding that now. Here's a slide showing um, um, a laboratory experiment. <clears throat> we have 2% fetal bovine serum. We have 10% fetal bovine serum. This is a serum that cells like and the, more, the higher the concentration, the more they like it, so it helps them grow. And this is PRP. So we can see that this slide shows that we get quite a big response. This is tenocytes, or tendon cells. Quite a big response in the growth of these tenocytes in the lab when you mix them with PRP. So now we talk about, well, what about multiple doses? Because that's another question. Do we do multiple doses of this stuff? This slide suggests that if you hit these cell cultures every four days, we can see that over time we get a much bigger response and growth. So protocols have changed. Uh, I'm now adding more PRP in a closer period of time when people have stubborn injuries. Um, I think other injection specialists are doing that as well. Another slide showing uh, effects of cells. Here we have tendon cells, tenocytes, and mix it with PRP. We see growth here. And here's the slide. Here's the controls with fetal bovine serum. So we see a marked increase in growth. Osteoblasts, which are cells that make bone, marked increase in growth. Chondrocytes, or cartilage cells, marked increase in growth. Muscle cells, marked increase in growth. So we are using these in muscle tears as well. <clears throat> Here's a couple things that kill the effect of PRP. Cortisone, lidocaine, and marcaine. These are local anesthetics. So local anesthetics are used to numb skin and make injection more comfortable. You have to be careful when you use it that you don't mix the anesthetic with your PRP down in the target tissue. You don't want the mixing because there is an inhibitory effect. Similarly, many patients have had cortisone injections into their chronic soft tissue uh, uh, problems. I don't believe that that's a great idea. It's still a medical practice that I think is going to die off eventually, but it's still used in many circles. But cortisone, if it's still in the tissues when you add PRP, it'll be inhib the PRP will be inhibited. Ken? Three months. And even at three months, you can still see cortisone crystals in tissue. But three months is, is uh, the guideline that I use. So uh, some research that actually shows a beneficial effect with PRP. This guy here, O'Hara, took 510 uh, cortisone versus 201 PRP uh, shots in the shoulder and uh, found a significant positive effect with PRP 
This was just out to three months, this study, very preliminary, very early, but cortisone very quickly is falling out of favor in terms of treating soft tissue problems that aren't responding to therapy. Cortisone's degenerative. It does weaken tissue. If you get too many of them in a close period of time, it just further furthers the tear or the degenerative changes we're trying to actually treat and avoid. It's not something I recommend. If you have clients, patients who are questioning whether or not cortisone's a good idea, because they're gonna still get that advice from a lot of physicians, I would say no. It's uh, something that I think can be used in very isolated circumstances, but it's not something I recommend um, for, the mo for most people. Uh, so this is a study on tennis elbow, very, very common problem. And uh, this compared cortisone to platelet-rich plasma. These guys went out to two years, so it was a good study, uh, longer term, and uh, definite positive effect. At two years, PRP, 85% of people felt at least 25% um, <clears throat> better. And at two years, 25% of people with cortisone felt at least 25% better. So, you know, this is a two-year study, so it gives us a little more punch that it is a preferred choice rather than cortisone for tennis elbow. And I believe this is the case for all tendinopathies. We're all into exercise. Exercise might actually encourage PRP to work or it might inhibit it. So some research has been done showing that both may occur. So what do I say to my patients? I like them to take three days off after a shot. Why? because I actually don't want them increasing their heart rate in the first three days. Why? Because extra circulation and cardiac output clears away whatever we injected. So I want that stuff to stay in that target tissue as long as possible. It eventually is gonna get uh, absorbed into circulation, um, so its effect will have end eventually. But I like them for at least three days to take it easy, yes. Well, that's a good point. If they have muscle damage in the area from that exercise, is that going to increase the effect of PRP? Yeah, so for, for patients that were doing close injections and in close proximity, I'll actually just tell them not to do anything until we finish the round of injections. Uh, there was another question? Okay. Okay, so that's exercise. So the point is we don't really know yet what exercise may do. So, you know, that's why I err on the side of a little bit of caution there with three days of doing nothing. So what about um, athletes that are actually monitored for drug use and being tested? What's the deal with them and PRP? Before 2011, WADA said no. They, uh, it was early, they weren't quite sure. Um, they were concerned about the growth factors and performance enhancement. So at that time, they said intramuscularly, no. Intratendinous, you needed a therapeutic use exemption. Has anybody ever personally applied for a two or had an athlete or a colleague personally apply for a two, TUE? It's a nightmare. <laughs> so if you ever have to do it, good luck. Or an athlete, good luck. It's tough. It's a, I mean, it's scrutinized, it's analyzed, and it's a big song and dance. But that's what they needed in 2011. Now, it's fine. More experience, more understanding. There's no problems at all with PRP in any athlete being monitored or drug tested. So it's perfectly legal. Don't need a therapeutic use exemption, nothing. I mentioned ultrasound guidance. There's been a number of studies that have shown that in this is just shoulder injections into something called the subacromial bursa, that 30%, up to 30% of fellowship trained shoulder specialists, so these guys are supposed to be pretty good at injecting the shoulder, miss the target. So you stick your needle in the patient, you think you know where you are, but you're not. And this is why we now use ultrasound guidance as much as we can, because ultrasound guidance helps us ensure that we actually hit our target. So, um, if you're uh, involved uh, with a client or yourselves, 
and you're looking for PRP or injection therapy, and you're, you're sort of researching uh, physicians and places to go, I think asking if they're in, um, <clears throat> guided injection, that's really important. Uh, there, there are physicians that are doing unguided injections, and you know, as long as you hit what you're trying to hit, you're fine, but as I said, it's uh, sometimes um, the case where you're not hitting your target. And here's an example. This is um, a pictorial here of the front view of a shoulder. Uh, this very thin area here is the subacromial bursa, right there. Now you can imagine putting a needle through the skin here and trying to hit it. That's pretty difficult because the space actually between there, when it's um, collapsed and normal, might be a millimeter. So, you know, hitting that, pretty challenging. So here's our ultrasound picture. Needle again coming in from the side, needle there. And this is the space. So uh, the space here is uh, expanded because this is already receiving some injectable. But um, this is magnified too. So we can see that it makes it a lot easier to find out where you're trying to target. Uh, so future methods of where we need to go with this stuff, we got to get formulations that are specific to the indication. We're not there yet. So cartilage might need something, tendons might need something. Are we going to concentrate other blood components that are currently in PRP? Yeah, probably we're going to go there. Want to get rid of unwanted growth factors, stuff that we think inhibits the, re the reaction that we're trying to promote. Yeah, that's where we got to go too. And the fourth thing, and this is some place we're already going, is we need to add cells in certain cases that get stimulated to repair. These are the stem cells. So this is now the next phase of injection therapies, including a source of stem cells. This is where I think it starts getting really exciting, because this is what we're doing nowadays. <clears throat> Here's a PRP, or a rather a ultrasound. This is the patellar tendon in an athlete. This is the patella, this thick white line here. This is the tendon. This dark area, black area, is a uh, damaged tendon. And with ultrasound, uh, in terms of soft tissue, black is typically bad, white is typically good. We're going to scan Richard's pectoral area later and show you a bit of what that looks like live. But this is basically what we're looking for. So this is a tear and degenerative change in an athlete. This is called jumper's knee otherwise called patellar tendinopathy or patellar tendon tear. So this is before, and we see the same area here afterward, much more white, which is good healthy tendon, and this is a repair that PRP stimulated in this particular person. So when we see scans before and after like this, I mean, it does work in, in many people. So onwards to the cells. This is stem cells. Stem cells are are a big deal now in many uh, uh, magazines and literature and you know everybody's publishing an article on stem cells. We got Time, Medical Journals, Time, Suzanne Summers, Life Extension, you know everybody's talking about them. They're the big deal and uh, Time Magazine named fat stem cell extraction as one of the 50 best innovations of the year um, a few years ago. This was in 2011. So, you know, people are talking about stem cells. And even stem cells for dummies. So if you need a quick and easy reference, there it is. You know when a topic makes it into the dummy books, it's something that's being talked about a lot. So we have definitely arrived with stem cells. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you have heard of this website. It's a neat site just to see what's being researched in the world in terms of numbers. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov. I did this yesterday as I was just fine-tuning my talk. I plugged in mesenchymal stem cells, which are the kind of stem cells we're interested in, and the database comes up with 560 studies currently being done internationally on mesenchymal stem cells. And you can do that for any topic you want if you want to know what the research uh, is going on in the world, where are they, who's doing them, this site will let you do it. So as of yesterday, 560 studies being done on mesenchymal stem cells that have been registered on this uh, database. So it's a hot topic in the research world. What are stem cells? Stem cells are cells that are unspecialized, 
They're self-renewing. They can be induced or stimulated to divide and make various different types of cells in the body. They have a crucial role in regenerating tissue and healing things in us. They are always reproducing themselves and they're found in humans at all stages of development. They're pretty special cells. <clears throat> they're controversial too but only because of embryonic stem cells, which are stem cells taken from embryos. There's obviously some controversy about that. The reason is, is that they're taken from this stage called the blastocyst stage, which is an embryo that's three to five days old, very young. And it results, of course, in the destruction of this blastocyst. So that's where the controversy is. Embryonic stem cells have three germ layers. These are the different layers that lead to different cells in our body, ectodermal, mesodermal, endodermal. We, in musculoskeletal medicine, only care about this layer because it's that layer that gives us all the tissues of the musculoskeletal system. So we got bone, cartilage, muscle, tendon, and ligament all coming from this layer and these types of stem cells. Here's a pictorial a fertilized egg, makes a First few cells, these are called totipotent. In other words, they change into anything. Then they make the blastocyst. This is three to five days of the embryo's development. These purple cells in here are pluripotent stem cells, meaning they don't quite have the power of totipotent, but they're pretty good. And then some of those cells go on to make these different cells, and these are the cells that we care about for the connective tissue in our bodies or the musculoskeletal system. Again, mesodermal or mesenchymal stem cells. That's what we're after. <clears throat> Adult stem cells, no controversy there. Adults have a couple of large stores of stem cells. They're postnatal, of course. They're multipotent, meaning they can change into various cell types. Two sources, one is bone marrow, and that's been the traditional source. And then really the entire history of medicine from an adult when we're looking for stem cells uh, or a child who's old enough, we're looking at bone marrow. But turns out fat is also a wonderful source of stem cells. In fact, fat, in my view, is a better source of stem cells than bone marrow. So <clears throat> here we have Stem cells that we find in fat, we call them adipose-derived stem cells. These are all the different cell lineages that these cells can differentiate into. Bone, muscle, liver, fat of course, heart, blood, certain glands, blood vessels, nerves, cartilage. Tendons aren't up there, but they should be. So these cells from, blood, or from fat can actually make all this stuff. So from a musculoskeletal standpoint, we're good. Bone marrow harvests can be very uncomfortable. They have to stick a very thick needle, or called a trocar, through bone. It's usually in a place around the uh, back posterior pelvic area. And I've seen some grimaces looking at that. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. It's frozen as much as we can, but this is uncomfortable as you can imagine. But that's where we get bone marrow from. <clears throat> and it's good stuff. I mean, if people use it, there are many injection physicians that do. It does uh, help repair things. There's studies that show that. In the United States, it's especially common when stem cell therapy is being talked about. Most of the time we're talking about bone marrow aspirations. Now, why adipose-derived stem cells? Four really important reasons. One, there's a ton of them. Even the thinnest person has enough fat to give for a stem cell procedure. Adipose has 100 to 1,000 times more stem cells per gram of tissue versus bone marrow. So it's a way more abundant source of stem cells. It's a minimally invasive procedure. It's pretty easy to get fat out of a person versus bone marrow. These cells differentiate in the cell pathways we discussed, and they're safely and effectively transplanted. So these are a good source. How do we do it? This is a person's buttock. 
I usually use the left side. Put a little freezing there. Put some very thin instruments underneath the skin where it's frozen. And we suck out some fat. We only need about six teaspoons of the stuff, depending on what we're doing, so it's not much. Abundant quantities of stem cells, easier harvest, less pain for the patient. I believe this is the future of musculoskeletal stem cell transplantation, but bone marrow is still by far the more popular technique. Why the left side? Because uh, I'm comfortable uh, sitting with my right arm that way. <laughs> Nothing more than that. <clears throat> So this is uh, what it looks like. This is the cannula. This is the skin, uh, epidermis, dermis, and then fat. So we're sticking this down in the fatty layer and we're pulling out fat. This is what it looks like once we've processed it. This is the fatty layer here. This is called infranatant. It's a bunch of blood and stuff we don't want. There's usually an oily layer up on the top as well. But this is after we spin it in a centrifuge and separate it. But it is this middle yellow layer that contains the fat that we're interested in. Again, Harvest makes a system that does this. There's the layer we're interested in. That's oil. And this is blood um, and other things that are spun down to the bottom of the tube. And this is the layer we're interested in. Cell manipulation is banned in first world countries. It's banned by the FDA in the US, it's banned by Health Canada. What does that mean? It means that once we take this stuff out of the person, we can't do anything to it. We can't add drugs to it. We can't expand them in a lab. You may have heard of stem cell expansion where they grow them in a laboratory. We're actually not allowed to do that. So when we take this stuff out, we've got to spin it and re-inject it right away. We can't do anything else to it, it's illegal. And this is really a carryover from our concerns about embryonic stem cells and working with embryonic stem cells. So right now it's a blanket policy. In time, I think our governing authorities will start to loosen up on adult stem cells, but right now there's still these barriers in place. <clears throat> so fat stem cells versus bone marrow stem cells is currently an ongoing debate. We have some studies that compare the two. Some studies show no differences in terms of outcome. Some do. There's more research on cartilage than anything else. And, um, but unfortunately, at this stage, there's no consensus on outcome. There's certainly consensus on ease of harvest. There's consensus on patient comfort. There's no arguments with those things. But outcome is still nobody sure. Bone marrow is usually painful, adipose comfortable. Harvest, this can be moderately difficult because it's painful. If the person's anesthetized and put asleep, of course, no problem, but oftentimes they're not. This is easy. We can do this in an office with a little bit of freezing. Patient's conscious, fully awake. Stem cell numbers, X, 100 to 1,000 times X in fat. Done in the hospital, sometimes in an office. This is definitely in an office. So therefore it's cheaper, because anything done in a hospital is much more expensive. Time consuming, well, harvesting bone marrow can take a little more time. Harvesting fat, usually we can harvest the right amount of fat within five to 15 minutes. It's pretty simple and straightforward. There's been some studies. So we have bone marrow versus adipose uh, in a study in rabbits, and who had some tendon injuries. And uh, strength was stronger in the tendon using fat at eight weeks in this study. What happens at 16 weeks and 24 weeks? Don't know. But at least we're off to a good start in this study with fat. Achilles tendon defect, again, with adipose-derived cells. Two groups of 15 rabbits. Both, all groups had a cre created a two centimeter defect in the tendon. Group one used fat, group two used a control. Fat was superior in strength and healing. And so we do know that fat works. I've seen it work myself many times. 
We rely on stem cells with very large tears and tendons that really are destined for the surgeons. This is an attempt to try and repair things without surgery. So Richard Singh, some of you know, Richard's a powerlifting champion, has had a few world records along the way, and um, uh, unfortunately last year ran into a bit of a problem uh, where he injured himself training. <clears throat> this is a bit of news I dug up when I was preparing this chat. This is back to 2007, a Toronto Star article, uh, Canadian sets powerlifting world record. And um, at that time, Richard, I think was, I don't know, 19 or so. Is that about right, Richard? Yeah. 453 pounds at the Amateur World Powerlifting Congress. And, um, and uh, he's been going from strength to strength ever since. This is a video that doesn't work, so I'll have to forget about it. We've tried our best to make it go, but it did. This is Richard uh, in Montreal at a subsequent competition, um, setting some additional records. So this is Richard's injury in December of 2014. Uh, Richard came to me having just uh, injured his left pec, uh, warming up with 400 and what was it? 410. 410. Warming up with 410. I think this was your first rep, was it? Yeah. And um, heard a pop, felt pain, and was in his left pec. <clears throat> Has anybody here had or seen or had clients or patients with a left pec tear? or sorry, a pec tear, <laughs> yeah, how about a left pec tear? Um, so this is, uh, this is an ultrasound scan of Richard's pec in December of 2014. Now, as I said earlier, ultrasound's very simple and very complex at the same time, but the simple part is white is good and black is bad. So this is the middle of his pec, right near the junction where the muscle meets the tendon, and as you see, this is all black, Here's the uh, one side of the tear. You can see these white areas here, they kind of fade to black here. And there's a kind of a demarcation right there where there's a bit of white left, but you go a little further and it's all black. And this black hole here is a combination of blood uh, resulting from the tear. You see a bit of white here, that's a bit of muscle tissue still there. But basically this whole thing is this void where there used to be pec. And now it's blood and uh, no really pec muscle fibers there uh, to speak of. So that was December of 2014. At that time, what we did with Richard is we did a stem cell PRP transplant. So we did take some fat, we mixed it with his PRP, and under ultrasound guidance, we injected into this void. This is two months later. We see this defect here is what was in, in December, now has shrunk down to this size. We can see a lot more white filling in around the area, so there's a new muscle starting to grow around this, in this torn area. Here's an area still needing repair, but we can see that he's well on his way. We can also see some white fibrillar areas throughout this dark area. These are muscle fibers starting to form but there's not enough of them there yet to produce this nice white look. But clearly the area has shrunk qu quite, amount, quite an amount, and we st uh, even in this dark area still see some signs of healing. So this was a very good sign, and this is February, two months later. Is that, is that related to less pain or more function as the size decreases? So is that uh, related to less pain and more function? Yes, absolutely, absolutely but not 100% yet, because there's still a defect there that needs to heal. This is October of 2015. I recently saw Richard again. This is the area. So for starters, we don't see the big black void that we saw a, uh, less than a year ago. We can see much more white stuff through this middle area. That's the area that in February was still a little dark there still are some little patches of dark throughout this area, I'm sure you can appreciate, but most of this now has filled in. And this was in October, just uh, last month. So this is the three of them all together. A year ago, original injury, two months later, 
and then in October. Quite a difference. And so this is all new muscle fiber that has been stimulated to grow in this, what was a very, very, very large tear. Ken. So in your experience, if you wouldn't have had the PRP uh, injection, would it still be the same on the left-hand side? Would it change? So the question is, would, would it have changed in the same way without these injections? What we typically will see in a large tear like this without this intervention is a lot more scar tissue and a lot more black holes even a year later in the tissue. And um, see this quite a bit where people are managed with tendon tears, muscle tears, and they come in a year later, they still might have a bit of pain, you scan them and you still see that there's actually still quite a bit of tissue that hasn't repaired. There's still holes in the tissue, there's abnormal scar, and so it's definitely that this process has stimulated a much better result. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a year later, if there's scar and they haven't had you know, treatment or at least it didn't help them maximally, can you inject then? You can. Um, what we're especially interested in, is, are there pockets still in the tissue of, of uh, torn tissue that still hasn't completely healed? And, and you'll often see that. Patient might feel pretty good, you know, they're feeling pretty strong, but there's still something not quite right. You scan them and you do see these pockets of tissue that still hasn't healed optimally. So those are definite times you can still intervene and try and stimulate a better response. Uh, did you add with this any uh, rehabilitation protocols such as treatment? Yes. So we're going to talk about that in a second. So the question is rehab. What did we do? And we're going to highlight that in just a minute. So this is the timeline for Richard in terms of this injury. I asked Richard to prepare this for me. <clears throat> November 15th last year, attempted 936 pound bench press at the World Championships. December 1st, tore his left pec warming up with 410 pounds as we just discussed. <clears throat> Mid-December is when I first met uh, Richard and uh, we were able to get things going pretty quick for him and four days later, on December 19th, we did the first stem cell PRP procedure. January 12th, and this is to your point about your rehab question, um, he started seeing Dr. Ken to begin the long road of rehabilitation. Um, so on that note, these procedures have to be followed by excellent rehabilitation. I recommend to all my patients, they've got to start rehabilitation uh, within two to four weeks. That's a very important part of this whole process. So much like surgery, where you don't want to operate on someone and just say you're fine, same thing with, with these procedures. So we always want an excellent rehab professional involved when we're doing these procedures with people. To the point where someone says to me, sorry doc, don't believe it, don't want to, can't afford to, I may actually say to them, well, I don't think you're a great candidate for this procedure because it really is important to get great rehab. Okay, so January 12th, started seeing Dr. Ken. March 30th is when uh, he started uh, getting a little looser guidelines to start some more training. Empty bar, six inches off the chest, some easy reps. For some of us, that would be pretty heavy reps in itself, but not for Richard. So that was in March. In April, 70 pounds off his chest, starting to get some strength back, some confidence. May 18th, wow, it's up to 500 pounds, four to six inches off his chest, so wasn't being allowed to touch the bar down to the chest yet with that kind of weight, but really making great progress. August, or sorry, June hit 600 pounds once again, four, six inches off the chest. 731 pounds, full range of motion in training in August. <clears throat> Competition hit 661 a week later, August 29th, back up to 705 and invited to the Arnold Freak Show. <laughs> That's in March. And then October 27th, met Richard again, or sorry, a few days prior. Rescanned him, 
still felt there were some pockets that needed some extra help. We did another procedure October 27th, stem cell PRP. Four weeks, well, three weeks later, roughly, we're going to do a booster shot, which is what I do about four weeks after, three, five, six, four weeks after, just PRP, putting it right back into the same place just to give it another push. And that's what we're going to do today. Any questions before we get set up for our injection? Quick administrative question in Ontario. Is it covered under OVIP and do you need a doctor referral, an MD referral to come see you or we own a clinic and we want to send somebody to that treatment? Not covered by OHIP, not covered by insurance. It's all private out of pocket for the patient. Um, referrals, sure, absolutely. No need for an MD referral in that case. No, you can come from anybody. Yeah, that's a great question. So for instance, uh, in a knee, might, maybe there's a defect in the cartilage, an osteochondral defect, uh, surface defect in a joint. Do we see good results with these procedures? The answer is absolutely yes. We have MRI evidence that we can grow cartilage with these procedures. We have arthroscopic evidence that we grow cartilage with these procedures. Uh, and so they do fix things, yes. Any more questions before we make our change over? Yes, sir. That's a good question. That's where the rehab comes in. So the question is, what direction do the fibers lay themselves down in when we stimulate this process? Do they lay themselves down in a linear fashion with the directionality of the structure we're injecting, or are they kind of haphazard? That's where the rehab comes in, because we want to stimulate those fibers to orient themselves linearly. That's what rehab does. If we don't do rehab, you're still going to get filled up with some of this great new tissue. But directionality of the fibers is not going to be the same. Therefore, the final outcome is not going to be the same. So after getting the PRP and then going through a little bit of rehab, will you, say for like an athlete, will you want to look at them again before saying, OK, you're, you're like, we don't need to do another treatment? Like, will you ch check again to see if you need to do another treatment? How does that kind of follow? Yeah, we follow up with them. We rescan them serially along the way. Um, clinical assessment is most important. How's the patient feeling? Uh, and then, of course, we scan them. If we see defects, we talk about it. If we don't, then they're on their way. Sir? Are there any side effects or contraindications? Side effects or contraindications? Um, <clears throat> Well, there are risks to any procedure that invades the body, as you may know. The top of the list is infection, uh, but thankfully it's a very rare risk. Um, but anytime we accept a needle into our bodies, we are accepting a risk of infection. There's a risk of nerve injury if you're you know, in areas where there's some significant nerves. Um, ultrasound helps us avoid those many times as well. But again, once you penetrate the skin, there's always a risk of infection, always a risk of neurovascular injury ultrasound uh, guided injections do reduce those risks. There's a few athletes and clinics going to Germany for this process because they think it's better. Yeah, so the German process is something called IRAP. It's an interleukin receptor antagonist protein. And what that is is an anti-inflammatory cocktail that's derived from blood. So it's a different process. It targets different things. It's not a regenerative injection so much as an injection to calm down inflammation due to arthritic processes. Uh, it's not legal in Canada, not FDA, or sorry, not Health Canada approved yet. Why don't we start our changeover? If there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer them while we're preparing for our injection. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we're gonna just transfer the cables, et cetera, are we guys? Okay, great. Any other questions? Age of the patient, I think, uh, you know, generally we think the older a person is, the less stem cells they have and, you know, the less quality stem cells they have, but there's no age limit. You know, we've never been able to define a cutoff, so absolutely anybody's a candidate. Yes, sir. Can you give any references for good uh, rehab protocols that are currently being practiced with, with different... 
Well, this is what I tell people who are from out of town and are going back to say other therapists. Just tell the therapist to treat you like you're post-operative. So that's the bottom line. So you get progressed just as if you had an operation. And then trainers, they come into the mix as the patient's you know, rolling along and making great progress and in contact with the therapist can start designing training programs for you know, out of clinic uh, rehabilitation. No, thankfully not. Um, no, uh, you know, the, I think the, the, the toughest part is just getting in for the initial consultation, but once they're in the system, we can usually get them on the schedule within a few weeks. Sir. Uh, are there any issues with arthrogenic inhibition, particularly with the intercapsular injection? No, there aren't. Um, but again, the goal is you got to get it moving after. Um, so that's another reason why I really insist on rehab because, you know, especially in a joint, these injections, they cause a bit of a, a bomb to go off, you know. I mean, it's very metabolically active. The joint will swell. Uh, it'll get stiff. And that's why we want to get the moving ASAP. Okay. How are we? Okay. Uh, Richard, come on up. So we got a camera that's going to be on my hands during this injection, and you'll see that on the big screen. And then this television or this monitor will have the ultrasound image. Uh, and this is Richard Singh. Thank you to Richard for volunteering. My head's up that way. All right. Yeah, you got your sleeveless. Great. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so the image will be on this monitor. And this is Irina, everyone, my nurse who helps me with my procedures. Thank you again also to Irina for coming. All right, Richard, let's just put your hand down here. Tuck it in. You okay there? Okay. Okay, so um, as I said, we last were in Richard's pack about three weeks ago. So this is going to be a surprise for me, too, in terms of what we're going to find. Can you turn that up like that? Comfortable? All right, perfect. Takes the gloves, thanks. So what I'm hoping to see is fat, which should still be there, because we just injected three weeks ago, and. We're hoping to still see some evidence of that. Now, sometimes people metabolize things very quickly, and um, we may not see fat. But again, all this is going to be a surprise for me as much as it is for you guys. So what we do first is we're going to ask Richard to tell me if anything's uncomfortable and sore. Right there. Pec injuries sometimes are surgically repaired. Those are injuries where the tendon has torn right off the bone. And then a surgeon could go in there and actually sew it back on the bone. In Richard's case, his pec muscle tore from the tendon. And that's not something that can be surgically altered. And so that's why we ended up having to do this. If he had torn his tendon off the bone, off the humerus, that would have been a surgical solution. 
and he would have had it operated on. So, you know, it was a bit unfortunate because a surgical repair, provided it's done quickly, is clean, simple, certainly requires a lot of rehab, but it's a little more straightforward than what we've had to do with Richard. So what I'm doing now, I just clean Richard's skin. I have another swab. How's it been feeling, by the way, Richard? So Richard, do we have a microphone uh, handy? Got one. Thank you. Yeah, so I asked Richard, how's it feeling? Uh, substantially better than after the first injection. So I got it redone and then my range of motion instantly increased. Great. So after we re-injected, your range of motion felt even better than before the injection? Yep. All right. That's interesting. That's not supposed to happen. <laughs> because, and it doesn't matter that it has, it's great that it has. But typically what people experience with these particular procedures is some stiffness and soreness. Um, of course, Richard had a big injury last year, and I think anything by comparison is going to be a lot better because thankfully it's a year later and, and much, much more comfortable. Okay, so you see the image on the monitor. And what we got to do is just hunt around for the right area, so just bear with me and we'll find what we're looking for. And while I'm hunting around, the top of the screen is Richard's uh, skin, and the bottom of the screen is deep into the pec. So that's the orientation. The left of the screen is rich toward Richard's shoulder, and the right, to the right of the screen, is toward <coughs> Richard's uh, right side of his, of his body. Does that hurt at all? Can you freeze that? Okay, so that image we've just frozen, and that's the area we're talking about. So it looks very good to me. So the middle of that area, you'll see a bunch of white stuff, and that's the area we injected a few weeks ago. The bright white areas uh, and the denser areas you can see in there are still uh, some globules of fat that are still remaining in the area. Um, but the, the areas that I was concerned about have definitely started to fill in, which is wonderful. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to boost this area with some PRP and really just give it another kick. Can you unfreeze that for me? And the pencil. Thank you. What I'm doing now is I'm just marking on Richard's chest where I'm going to target. Okay, freeze that again. Thank you. So we mentioned earlier about um, freezing. And we don't want to put freezing so deep as we're mixing it with the actual PRP. But we do want some freezing. So what we're going to do is we're going to just, sorry Richard, just a poke. We're going to freeze skin and we're going to freeze just underneath the skin. Not deep enough to mix with the PRP because the PRP is going deeper. And 
OK, Richard? All right. So we keep the freezing more superficial. But we do want some in there, because we want to try and take some of the edge off this. Once we get down into the muscle deeper, it's not as sensitive an area anyway. And unfreeze, please. You OK there? more breathing. You'll see from the top right of the screen, we're sliding in. And you'll see the tip of the needle right OK, Richard. OK, so hopefully you can all see that motion there. And that's our needle in place. And we're right in that white area. That's where all the fat st still is. And we're just going to actually now start to inject. You should see a little bit of movement on the machine as we're injecting. And that's it. OK? All right. What's harder, 930 pounds or this? This. <laughs> OK, so as you can see, when we use the ultrasound, it enables us to get down to the level that we need to. If we didn't have ultrasound, there's no way we would know where that level is. Um, the other thing uh, with, with people like Richard, of course, there's a lot of muscle tissue and a lot of thickness. And same thing. You just don't know where you are unless you're using the ultrasound machine. Any, any questions at all? Sir? Is there, kind of back there, the rehab one, is there a difference between the joint and like uh, maybe a tissue with like the movement? So you said three days, normally you want no, no movement, now, but you said it's really important to get the joint start moving again, say if, it's, if you're injecting the joint, like would you shorten that day up, those days up at all for a joint compared to you know, maybe a cast strain or something? So no, no movement, just to be clear, means you can still do day-to-day -day things no matter what we've injected. So we still want you moving. Um, and uh, the, the, the rehab, we, we just give them a week or so to settle in. Um, now, if you're an elite athlete um, uh, or there's a real time pressure to get better, then you know, you're going with rehab with, within a day or two. But most of the people you know, aren't elite athletes, of course. And so we give them a week or so just to settle in. They will get some increased discomfort. We want them just to sort of relax as best they can without worrying about running out to rehab. And then a week later, we start started going. Yes? Um, I understand there's a previous injury to this as well. Was that to PRP too, or was that to the kids too? Previous to when I was yeah, involved? Tricep oh, did you have tricep there? Yeah, no, that just healed on its own? Yeah. And some therapy, I guess? With Dr. Ken. Yeah, most things can heal with Dr. Ken. Uh, so, but there, um, sometimes injuries are pretty big, and uh, time is of the essence, and so that's where these procedures can be very helpful. Thank you. You okay, Richard? Big hand for Richard for. Thank you, Richard, for allowing us to do this. Much appreciated. Just stay there for a second. There's no rush. OK, any other questions? Sir. What about multiple tears? So let's say there's two or three tears in the shoulder. Do you treat all of them at the same time? 
Yeah. Uh, separate areas? Sure. Um, so if, um, thank you. if there are multiple areas that need treatment, then we try and do them. Um, and so it's all dependent on, on how much fat you can get, and there's a limited amount of actual PRP you can actually produce. Uh, so, you know, we take that all into account when we decide how many areas we can actually treat. But we can usually get a large area for sure, and a couple of medium-sized areas for sure. Um, so it, it is done multiple areas if we can. Anything else? All right, well thanks everybody for coming. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That was incredible as far as uh, getting that type of information and on behalf of the uh, delegates and Swiss I'd like to give you this uh, wow. book on uh, the body movable on Thank you. anatomy and kinesiology and everything else so we just had them printed up last week okay thank you, thank you. my pleasure thank you thank you